Good morning, and welcome to worship today at St. Paul Lutheran as we continue our series this seventh Sunday of Easter on witnessing. And our focus today is witnessing to the ends of the earth. Uh, we meet with the disciples and Jesus on the, the hill from which Jesus ascended as he gives his church their marching orders uh, from the book of Acts, and that'll be our focus today. Jesus, in our gospel lesson, also as he prays to his heavenly Father, uh, says, Lord, you are leaving these that you have given me in the world, uh, as he has left us in this world while Jesus has ascended. And he's left us for that particular reason, to witness, and witnessing also to the ends of the earth. We follow the order of service printed for you in our service folder. If you're able to download that from our website, spljordan.com. Our opening hymn is A Hymn of Glory, Let Us Sing. The words of the hymn are on the screen if you were not able to download the bulletin. May God bless our worship today.
stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. been merciful to us and has given his only son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son, our Savior, was taken up in glory and intercedes for us at your right hand. Through your living and abiding word, give us hearts to know him and faith to follow where he has gone, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. A lesson from the book of Acts, chapter 1. A portion of this lesson will serve as the basis for the sermon today. I wrote my first book, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began doing and teaching until the day he was taken up, after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After he had suffered, he presented himself alive to the apostles with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and told them things about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for what the Father promised, which you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they were together with him, they asked, Lord, is this the time when you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has sent by his, set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said these things, he was taken up while they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he went away. Suddenly, two men in white clothes stood beside them. They said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here looking up into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mountain called the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, about a Sabbath day's journey away. When they entered the city, they went to the upstairs room where they were staying. Peter and John were there, also James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All of them kept praying together with one mind, along with the women, with Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm today is Psalm 124, which is printed in the service folder and is also available on your screen.
lesson from 1 Peter chapter 4. Dear friends, do not be surprised by the fiery trial that is happening among you to test you, as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, rejoice whenever you are sharing in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted in connection with the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, a thief, a criminal, or as a meddler. But if you suffer for being a Christian, do not be ashamed but praise God in connection with this name. For the time has come for judgment to begin with the household of God. Now if it begins with us, what will be the end for those who disobey the gospel of God? Therefore, humble yourselves under God's powerful hand so that he may lift you up at the appointed time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Have sound judgment. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him by being firm in the faith. You know that the same kinds of sufferings are being laid on your brotherhood all over the world. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who called you into his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Please stand. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Alleluia. The Gospel according to John, chapter 17. Jesus had spoken these things, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son so that your Son may glorify you. For you gave him authority over all flesh, so that he may give eternal life to all those you have given him. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. I have glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me at your own side with the glory I had at your side before the world existed. I revealed your name to the men you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have held on to your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they received them. They learned the truth that I came from you. They believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, because they are yours. All that is mine is yours, and what is yours is mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no longer going to be in the world, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. our Christian faith with the Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth I believe in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified died and was buried he descended into hell the third day he rose again from the dead he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
You may be seated. We sing the hymn of the day, hymn number 577, Rise, O Light of Gentile Nations. God of all grace, who called you into his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself establish, strengthen, and support you. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, have you ever experienced a moment in life when you realize that a chapter in your life has closed? If you're a senior right now, graduating from high school or from college, you're probably feeling that way right about now. If you've lost a spouse or a child, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. My grandparents' farm in Michigan is where I spent many a Christmas and many a summer day. Sometimes I was there for muscle, to help bale hay or do other chores on the farm. Sometimes I was there to sit out underneath the big maple trees and have a picnic. And it's true, for the last 20 years of my life, I haven't been able to go there as often as I could before, but now the farm is being sold outside of the family. 
you begin to realize that that chapter in your life is now closing. Now even the ability to go there to that place is gone. A chapter in my life is closing. I wonder if the disciples got that feeling too as they watched Jesus rise into heaven. Life for them had been centered around Jesus for the last three years. They went where he went. They listened while he talked. They did what he told them to do. They even thought that they lost him one time and then got him back again. But they knew that this time would be different. A new chapter was opening in the life of the disciples, and it is a chapter that you and I find ourselves in those pages as Christians. Jesus there on that mountainside was closing a chapter in the life of the disciples, but he was also opening a new one up for them. And he told them what this new chapter would be all about. They would be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. This wasn't the new chapter, though, that the disciples had in mind. As they gathered there on the Mount of Olives, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? The miracles that the disciples saw Jesus perform, and now the resurrection from the dead, and all of the talk of his kingdom— these all prove to the disciples that Jesus is the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son. But their question, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Was a very inward-looking one. They wanted Jesus to be the new Jewish king. The Roman Empire ruled the world in those days, and it was now climbing to the height of its power. But perhaps, perhaps a king like Jesus who could perform such miracles and do such things, like rise from the dead, could restore Israel to the powerful heights that she once knew. Perhaps Jesus would restore the spiritual life of Israel and its political life too. Still, the disciples failed to completely understand that Jesus' kingdom is a spiritual one where he intends to rule, but rule in the hearts of people by faith. As he told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus' kingdom is, is not advanced by military or political might, but by his powerful word, which has the Holy Spirit working through it to create faith and to grow his kingdom. They did not yet clearly understand that Jesus' kingdom is not made up of just Jewish people only, but of people from all over the world. So Jesus answers them, it's not for you to know the times and dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You see, Jesus shows them that there are things that, that Jesus' followers don't need to be concerned about. You and I know that truth very well. We know there are questions that, that followers of God would like to have answers, but here Jesus says, you don't need the answers to those things. When the Father will bring about the completion of his plan in history is his business. There's much that Christians want to know about those things, about God's plans and procedures and his times and dates. But they're God's business, not ours. But there is something that Christians are to be concerned about, and that is being Jesus' witnesses not only in Jerusalem, but also in the areas just north of Jerusalem and Judea, and also a little further north of that in Samaria, but even beyond that, to the ends of the earth. Now, this was going to be hard for the disciples, because their whole history as Jewish people had them looking inwards, 
God's law itself kept them in quarantine from other nations. But now he tells them to go out and reach out to those other nations. Read through the book of Acts and see how tough it was for those Jewish Christians to begin reaching out to the Gentiles, non-Jewish people with whom they came into contact. The plan and purpose that Jesus did want his people to do was going to be hard. And even for us in our church in Jordan, Minnesota, it can be hard when we think about Jesus' call to be witnesses. It's so easy for churches to be just as inward focused as the disciples. We make decisions on, on how we're going to spend our offerings. We make decisions about how we are going to serve our people. We certainly don't want outsiders to change the way that we have always done things. It even gets to the point where you hear people say, and, and well-meaning, let's not men send money to missions in other places because we need that money here. Now it's true. We have ministry to carry out here to our own members and to our children. But we must always remember that the gospel is not ours to hide as our own personal treasure, but it's one for us to share. And when we have carried that, that inward-focused attitude, when those thoughts have penetrated our hearts, we lay those things, too, at Jesus' cross we ask for his forgiveness for the selfish ways and the unloving way we have hoarded the treasure of the gospel too often instead of working to share it. And Jesus reminds us in his prayer for his people today in our gospel lesson, I have glorified you, Father, by finishing the work you gave me to do. He has taken away our sins and reminds us that he has given eternal life to all those given to Jesus by faith. And it's in that grace of forgiveness that we see Jesus in our lesson today ascend into heaven, leaving us in the world to be his witnesses. And the angels remind us today that while we wait for Jesus to return, we have work to do. He reminds us that we have that mission to carry out of being his witnesses to the ends of the earth. But when we think about that, that whole idea of being witnesses to the end of the earth, we get a little scared. Is Jesus asking me to quit my job and travel to another country? Not necessarily. First, it's true that Jesus calls us to be witnesses wherever we live. He told the disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, where the disciples were currently at. Which makes us think, who are the people in our neighborhoods to whom we can reach out? And that's a question that only you can answer. There are people all around you who are lost and hurting and need to know the forgiveness and peace that comes through Jesus. And it is incumbent upon us to open our eyes and see the mission field that is right outside our front door. In January, a second career pastor who had at one time been a homicide detective told the story of doing mission work in the town that he was called to serve. And as he was at this church, he was working through old cards of prospects from the town that had been around for years and had been handed down to him. And he worked very hard at his church work in trying to reach out to as many of those prospects as, as quickly as he possibly could. And after working tirelessly for many hours, his wife reminded him that he has another family that needs his attention too. So he took a little bit of a break and he scheduled a dinner date uh, to go out with his wife. But after dinner on the way home, in a very brave move, he asked her, do you mind if I stop at the door of a prospect on the way home? 
And she relented, and, and she let him stop and knock on the door, and she in, invited, he invited his wife to come up to the door with him. And a woman did come and answer the door, and it was at that time that he found out that he had been knocking on the wrong door all along from the prospect cards that he had. But she said to him, will you come in? And they went in, and she said that she had been trying to compose a poem or a song or a prayer, and she had the title. It was, Please Stop the Pain. She said, I... I sat at the table to work on this and I bowed my head and I folded my hands and I was going to pray and the doorbell rang and it was you. And the pastor responded, no. See, he was a former homicide detective and he thought in his head, you don't make detective by believing people or thinking that they are good. But two hours later, the woman gave the pastor and his wife a hug and said, I will see you on Sunday. And she came, and she brought a friend. The pastor giving the presentation told us, I was doing all of the things at church you were supposed to do, like Christmas for Kids and VBS, but nobody came because of those things. But he watched people come to their church one by one, because people invited them. Can you be the person who brings one? As you are Jesus' witness in your Jerusalem? Jesus also calls on us to look beyond our own hometown and think about the gospel work in the world. The area of Judea and Samaria is the region to the north outside of Jerusalem, and Samaria was filled with Samaritans, people that the disciples would have been raised to dislike very much. But they were a part of Jesus' mission field too. And it didn't stop there. Jesus calls them to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. Can you be a witness to the ends of the earth? Sure, you could quit your job and learn to be a missionary and head out and get going. Or you can do it like they did in the book of Acts. The people of the congregation in Antioch didn't quit their jobs and head out to be missionaries, but they set apart a man named Paul and a man named Barnabas and sent them off into the greater Roman Empire to be witnesses for Jesus, and they supported their mission work as best they could. Brothers and sisters, you and I, can do and are doing the same things with our mission offerings. As we join together with Christians all across North America in the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, we train pastors and teachers to go out and share the gospel in places where we can't go. This past week, graduates from Martin Luther College and Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary receive their assignments to go out into the world and be witnesses for Jesus. You supported their education, and you support the mission fields where some of them will be serving. And through your mission support, there are places all over the world where the gospel is being proclaimed. Places like Liberia, and Hong Kong, Albania, and Brazil, and our newest outreach to the Hmong who are living in Vietnam. Or here's a, a, a crazy idea. Why don't we organize a group from our congregation to join with Wells Mission Journeys? and travel like this group from Rochester, Minnesota, who went to Escondido, California, where they did mission work for one of our churches there. The call is clear. We are to be Jesus' witnesses, sharing with others the precious gospel of the forgiveness of sins and eternal life that we treasure. 
And the opportunities are endless for each of us to personally witness to our neighbors and for us as a church to reach out to the world. Let's not stand around watching for Jesus' return, but go about the work Jesus has called us to do. Amen. Please stand. pray. Heavenly Father, as our nation pauses to remember those in the military who have given their life for freedom, the freedoms that we enjoy, we pray you would have us all look to you for strength, comfort, and guidance. Be with all who serve in our armed forces. Bless them and their families. Grant your love and protection to them. Let peace prevail among all the nations. Especially let your mercy rest upon our land, even as we acknowledge with thanksgiving your past goodness on this country. If it is your will, preserve the lives of the men and women in uniform as they defend our citizenry. Most of all, we pray that you would turn the hearts of all, military and civilian, to your holy word, where we find the true peace for our sinful souls that surpasses all understanding. Keep us repentant of sin, Move us to know, take hold, and treasure your saving grace. God of all grace, we pray for those earthly leaders who are guiding us through this pandemic. We pray for President Trump and all those who are advising him. We pray for Governor Waltz and his advisors as they seek to protect the lives, safety, and well-being of all in our country and state. We also pray for our leaders here at St. Paul Lutheran as they seek to do the same for our flock. Give them wisdom and understanding during this time. But most of all, we look to you, our God and Savior, for healing and help, protection and guidance, that we may balance our desire to worship and praise you with the safety and well-being of our people. We know that you care about both. Lord, we pray also for those who are sick or suffering, especially Ron Jabs, Mary Syriax, Merv Branke, and any others we are unaware of. We pray also for the family of Jody Boisjoli, the niece of Elaine Steer, who is battling cancer. Finally, give us continued hope. You have made us your dear children through holy baptism and have given us a glorious inheritance in heaven with you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Bring us into a firmer faith in your promises by guiding us all into your word more and more in our daily lives. Though we are not physically present at church, we are never separate from you. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We sing, In the Cross of Christ I Glory.
blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our final hymn is Then the Glory. It's a hymn that looks forward to the glory that we will receive when we go to heaven. It's, it's the expect expectation and hope of the Christian looking forward to all that God has promised. Good morning. Thankfully, we didn't have any thunder boomers come through our sound system this morning as the, the rain and the thunderstorms arrived today. A couple of things I'd like to point your attention to. You probably heard a lot of changes this week, again, as far as proclamations, as churches being essential, and, and uh, Governor Walls um, easing the restrictions there a bit on churches. My encouragement right now is don't assume at this point that we will be open this next week. There is a lot in the new regulations that we have to work through to make sure uh, that we can do everything in a safe manner. I plan to meet with our council early in this week so that we can look at that guidance again and, and go over the things that we would need to do uh, to safely open, as well as looking at the numbers of infections and things, especially with the increased testing that was ha is happening over this weekend. So I would say look for guidance again on our website and our other media platforms, including our e-news uh, here in, around midweek or so, and we can keep you uh, up to date and informed as to where things are going at this point. This morning, we also have the Wells Connection, um, and it's uh, a really one that kind of hits close to home for us, as many of you uh, probably remember Pastor Redfield from Trinity and Belle Plain uh, preaching here at our congregation during Lent and so forth, and the focus in this is on the mission to the visually impaired. And the reason that Pastor Redfield is involved is his daughter Libby uh, is also blind and, um, and benefits from the work that the mission um, does. So please enjoy the Wells Connection today and God's blessings to you on the rest of your week.
Hello, I'm Reverend Jim Beringer, Director of Well Special Ministries. More than 60 years ago, women of the Lutheran Women's Missionary Society stepped up to inaugurate our Synod's Mission for the Visually Impaired. Many women learned Braille. Countless others helped manage the ministry. Their first project was a Braille version of the Catechism. Then they moved into audiobooks and beyond. Today, the ministry continues to grow thanks to new technologies and an eagerness to spread the gospel. When Pastor Tim Redfield and his wife Megan adopted Libby, they knew she had a number of challenges that included blindness. <laughs> High five. <laughs> Find my hand. High five. <clears throat> High five. And they also learned she has some special gifts, which became clear one day when she started playing songs on the piano, even though she'd never had a lesson. And Megan and I were just shocked. She listens, takes it in, never had any lessons, uh, and, and plays beautiful music. Uh, so it definitely, my prayer for her is that she can use her musical gifts to serve the church in some way. While Libby may indeed serve the church someday, the more immediate question is, how can we in the church serve her and the many thousands like her who have visual impairments? Part of the answer is here, at the Wells Visually Impaired Workshop in Minnesota, where volunteers gather to convert synod materials into braille, large print, and audio, materials that are used all over the world. The need is bigger than what most people think. Every single congregation has somebody or several people that are visually impaired. 24-30. That's it. That's it. The materials created here can help connect the visually impaired to the larger community of believers. Capital Sun. I lost my vision. It'll be 13 years next month. If you wanted to go look up um, a passage or you, or you were at church and wanted to sing, what, do you, what happens when you can't see that anymore? You start losing that peace and you start losing the connection that you have and giving them something that they can hang on to and count on, very important. That helpful attitude, that's what kind of runs through all of our volunteers. They, they really enjoy knowing that what they're doing is going to get the word to someone else. This is the listen.wells.net page. This will... It's a time of great opportunity for this ministry as new technologies allow us to multiply our reach. Here, a team in Milwaukee is connecting Wells publications to an Amazon service called Polly that will read our Synod's books out loud for users at no additional cost. We want to translate the entire People's Bible using Amazon Polly, so you don't actually need the reader someone actually reading a document, but rather we're using the computer to, to read it. It's just been really refreshing to listen, to have the opportunity to listen to God's Word. What a wonderful blessing to have these, you know, doctrinally sound, these biblically sound um, resources available for our daughter, but also for so many other people that they can make use of the resources. Whether it's our youngest members, our oldest members, or people who are not members at all. Wells' mission for the vision impaired is bringing the gospel to the world. Wells' mission for the visually impaired is run by volunteers, people like you who are committed to this important work. Today, it's easier than ever to be part of this ministry because much of the work can be done from home. We want to thank you, the members of LWMS who have been with us from the beginning.